Hydra as a model system has many advantages, but every model system has many disadvantages also. So you have to choose a model system depending on the question you ask. So we are interested in things like how the first nervous system may have evolved. We know Hydra was the organism which developed the evolved the nervous system for the first time in the animal kingdom. That's how it can, uh, you know, feed actively. Sponges cannot feed actively; they pick up food particles by phagocytosis. But Hydra is a nervous system, so it can coordinate with the tentacles. It can paralyze the prey, put it in its mouth, and digest. So that's a huge step in development. Somebody has said that is one of the ten major steps in evolution: active feed. Hey, hi! Welcome to Biotech Talks. You are a multicellular organism, right? The cells in you communicate with each other, and that is how your tissues functions. That is how your organ function, and that is how you become you. So it is very important to understand how the cells in us communicate with each other. In other words, it is very important to understand how cell signaling pathway works. So there is a small freshwater organism known as Hydra, whose cell signaling pathways are conserved in humans. So you can understand how cell signaling pathway occurs in humans by understanding the cell communication in Hydra. So what is Hydra, and why Hydra is so important to understand developmental biology? Okay, that is what we are going to get to know today in this episode of Biotech Talks. So today with us we have Dr. Surendra Gaskarbi. He is an emeritus scientist at Agarkar Research Institute, Pune. He has done research on Hydra for last two decades. So years of research and a very prominent developmental biologist. I hope you enjoy today's episode of Biotech Talks. Hello, sir. How are you? Hi. I'm fine. Surviving. <laughs> Uh, why do researchers study Hydra to understand developmental biology? Okay, so uh, let me first quickly tell you early development. We all start our development as a unicellular zygote when the ovum is fertilized by father's sperm. And then uh, it undergoes a lot of cleavage divisions and becomes a ball of cells. And that ball of cells has to be now converted into an organism with dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior and different organs and systems and so on. So, what in case of Hydra, Hydra shows many features of vertebrate embryos in the sense that uh, cellular processes like cell proliferation, cell adhesion, cell motility, uh, cell differentiation and cell death, all these occur in, a, in an adult Hydra. So, it is like a perpetual embryo. You can study embryonic processes in an adult organism continuously. That's one of the advantages of Hydra. The other is that Hydra, if you cut it into pieces, it regenerates. Therefore, there is continuous pattern formation going on. So you can study pattern formation because during development, patterns develop in our body, right? And the you know spectacular example of patterns is the stripes of zebra or the spots on butterfly wings and so on. All these patterns develop during development. And since it, pattern formation occurs continuously in Hydra, it's a very good model system to do that. And thirdly, immediately I can think of another thing is that Hydra reproduces both asexually and sexually, asexually by budding and sexually by, you know, fertilization. So you can study that also. So both kinds of uh, reproduction, early development during those kinds of reproduction strategies can be studied. And this can happen again and again in the lab. You can study it uh, continuously. Therefore, people have been using it. It's in fact the first aquatic organism that was ever brought to the lab okay. in 1744. So uh, I was going through your paper that you shared to me and in that I came across grafting experiments. So can you please describe these grafting experiments? Okay. So uh, these grafting experiments, uh, this is a strategy basically used by developmental biologists to find out how different uh, cell types develop in the early embryo. What kind of signals they receive? Where do the signals emanate? Where do they come from? So what people have done is, in early vertebrate embryos like the frog embryo and the chick embryo, people have used discrete pieces of embryos and transplanted them on different areas in a host embryo. So for example, the classical experiment was by Spiemann in which his student Mangold transplanted a piece from the dorsal side of an embryo to the ventral side of a host embryo. 
and that ventral side of the host embryo was converted into dorsal as a result of which it became a twin embryo. That means they, th that graft which contains basically a few cells, they uh, secreted some signal by which the fate of the surrounding tissue was now changed from ventral to dorsal. So grafting experiments can tell you what kind of influences are necessary for uh, differentiation to progress and what types of cells actually send those signals. So by grafting pieces from one embryo to another, you can actually predict which kind of signals are necessary and what are the responding cells which will respond to the signals. And this has also been done in Hydra. And this was the first experiment of grafting was actually done in 1909 in Hydra, which was later done in Frog, for which Spiman got a Nobel Prize. So you mentioned that Hydras are immortal. And then why, what is the reason for that? So basically Hydra is considered to be potentially immortal. Let's not say immortal because we are no, we, nobody will be alive to check that actually. So potentially immortal, okay? <laughs> that's, that's the careful terminology that one would use. So what happens in case of Hydra? Hydra is a cylindrical organism made up of about 100,000 cells. And the cells, uh, main stem cells reside in the middle of the Hydra body column. Okay. It is an oral end, it is an aboral end and there is a body column in between. Those cells continuously proliferate and they migrate towards the two extremities of the body of Hydra. And as they migrate, they also differentiate, carry out the functions that they are supposed to carry. But after 20 days, the, every cell gets sloughed off, undergoes apoptosis and is thrown out of the body or it ends up in the bud. So at any given point of time, Cell in Hydra is only 20 days old. Any cell, you know, because they are continuously proliferating. So the mother cell is no more there, you have daughter cells. And they again proliferate and differentiate. So Hydra is actually be becoming renewed every day. Unlike higher organisms like us, who don't replace our cells. And therefore, it remains young forever. And nobody has actually demonstrated natural death of Hydra. People have done experiments. Some poor PhD student was given a polyp. The Hydra polyp refused to die in four years. They had to change his PhD problem. Because, you know, because of this re re renovation of tissues all the time. There was a paper about two, three years back in Nature in which that group of authors had developed an algorithm to find out what could be the life expectancy of different species, including plants and animals. So from that algorithm, they predicted that a Hydra polyp should live at least for 10,000 years. But that's a prediction. And in any case, that cannot be confirmed by any one of us. We will be completely wiped out. <laughs> so it is potentially immortal. See, it, I also mentioned earlier that it is like a perpetual embryo. So it will not age and die. So it escapes what is known as organismal senescence. It doesn't escape cellular senescence. Cells age, but organism as a whole does not age. We age because our cells age, they are not replaced. Yeah. So that's the difference. Because the cells, old cells are continuously replaced. Now if you, all your old cells are continuously replaced, you will not become old. Yeah. So that is, I think, the main reason why it remains young forever. So, so what will happen if I cut the head of Hydra? Will it uh, die? Okay, so this experiment was also done in 1744 when Hydra work was first published by Abraham Tremblay. What he did was he cut the polyp, as it is known, into two pieces. Both the pieces re uh, regenerated the lost parts. So if you cut a, a head of Hydra, it can regenerate. So Hydra has a tremendous capacity of regeneration. Planaria can also do it. You can make 256 pieces of a planarian. All of them will form a new planarian. But in case of Hydra, it is even more spectacular because you can cut a hydra into 20, 30, 50 pieces, they will all regenerate except for the two extremities which contain the differentiated cells. Not only that, you can separate all cells of hydra by using chelating agents or trypsin. Make a pellet, that pellet will regenerate into a new hydra. So hydra has a tremendous capacity of regeneration. That is why it is one of the models that is used for developmental biology as well as regenerative biology. So Hydra, that in that respect also is immortal. And actually, if you cut Hydra head slightly vertically, 
then this hydra will develop two heads. If you take two cuts, it will develop four heads. So there is a multi-headed monster in Greek mythology called Hydra and you can see King Hercules killing it. So it gets its name from there. Although this is a very nice and delicate organism as you just saw. Nothing monstrous about it except for its prey. <laughs> so that is why it gets name because it can become multi-headed. It can form many heads. And all these heads, uh, you know, eat. Huh? They can compete for food also. So I think all these uh, things have actually inspired many of the mythological figures also. Multiple yeah. names, multiple heads. That, that's what I would think. <laughs> so why Hydra is important in understanding the cell signaling pathway? Oh, uh, because, you know, uh, cell signaling is basically important for all multicellular organisms. Yeah. Multicellular organisms have cells which carry out different functions. And uh, their discrete functions help the organism to survive and reproduce. For that, the cells must talk to each other. And that is through very discrete signals. And since Hydra is one of the first multicellular organisms, after sponges, you know, poriferans, the cells have to talk to each other. And therefore, those cell signaling mechanisms have evolved in Hydra. And that is why uh, it is one of the first organisms to have developed signaling pathways. And these have interestingly been conserved up to humans. So you do research on, uh, you have done research on cell signaling pathway in Hydra. Right. So how do we actually, how do you actually perform that in lab experiments? So basically, uh, not much was known about Hydra. There are many labs working on this as uh, was mine. So now with recombinant DNA technology and bioinformatics, it has become fairly easy. If you have a reasonably good lab and good bioinformatics, it's fairly easy to find out cell signaling molecules from different species. Because you already have the uh, details, the amino acid sequence, the nucleotide sequence of cell signaling molecules, uh, I mean genes and proteins. And that you can, by using bioinformatics, you can find out whether similar signal uh, sequences exist in Hydra. Then you try to clone those genes and see if they actually carry out a function, whether they actually translate into a protein and carry out any uh, specific function which helps cells of the organism to talk to each other. Because cells have to coordinate, otherwise a multicellular organism will not function. You also studied the DNA repair mechanisms in Hydra. So what conclusions did you make out of it? So uh, surprisingly DNA repair mechanisms of Hydra were not studied earlier and I don't know the reason for that. As you are well aware that our DNA is continuously damaged yeah. by physical, chemical agents and various things. And they are continuously repaired also. So it happens all the time in our body. And when the balance shifts towards damage, then people can have, uh, you know, initiation of cancer or genetic uh, hereditary diseases and so on. So uh, it was surprising that it was not done in Hydra. And because Hydra shows or does not show organismal senescence, or escapes aging, then uh, the DNA of every cell has to be maintained properly. That's what is necessary. Mm -hmm. Because if the DNA is damaged, then obviously pro progeny will be damaged and the organism cannot survive properly. So we thought of looking at DNA repair mechanisms fr from Hydra. And uh, to begin with, we studied uh, the xeroderma pigmentosum genes. So these XP genes are actually uh, uh, required for DNA repair, nucleotide excision repair, uh, one of the repair mechanisms. And they, if that defect, if that repair is defective in humans, it causes a disease called xeroderma pigmentosum. So these people are very sensitive to UV. They develop skin cancers. Now, that sequences, amino acid sequences and nucleotide sequences were available. So we looked at hydra material, whether such sequences are there. And to our surprise, all XP genes are present in Hydra. And in uh, three or four cases, we have actually shown that they participate in DNA repair also. So Hydra is also exposed to environmental pollutants in water. Yeah. It is exposed to some level to UV. And therefore, repair mechanism has to be present there. And some, in one case, we have found that the molecule is uh, predominantly present in the stem cells of Hydra. So it's very important. And it has another connotation, this work, uh, which nobody has looked at, is uh, Nidarians also contain corals. 
and we have lot of coral bleaching mm -hmm. because of various factors and uv could be one of them so we think the even dna repair in coral should be studied so that has told us that hydra has a very robust dna repair mechanism and the cell signaling molecules of hydra as well as dna repair molecules of hydra are more similar to human molecules or vertebrate molecules than to drosophila or cynorhabditis that came as another surprise but all over the world everybody has found that that they show similarity with uh, genes and proteins from higher organisms like vertebrates is there any, is there any evolutionary explanation for this not yet we have no clue so hydra actually throws out more questions than gives answers uh, it gives very nice phenotypes it gives very nice abnormalities but they are very difficult to explain and the reason is that many of these modern techniques in biology recombinant dna technology you know, are being applied to hydra only recently transgenic first transgenic hydra was made only in 2006 the hydra genome was published only in 2010 and there is a new study uh, in this year so uh, it's an exciting model system but there are a lot of experimental problems there so tools are if you take drosophila and if you take hydra working with hydra is at least 50 times more difficult than working with drosophila but then on a on a practical scale there is also much less competition here yeah. every other person works on those who feel you know so it so hydra as a model system has many advantages but every model system has many disadvantages also so you have to choose a model system depending on the question you ask yeah. so we are interested in things like how the first nervous system may have evolved we know hydra was the organism which developed the evolved the nervous system for the first time in the animal kingdom that's how it can uh, you know feed actively okay. sponges cannot feed actively they pick up food particles by phagocytosis but hydra is a nervous system so it can coordinate with the tentacles it can paralyze the prey put it in its mouth and digest it so that's a huge step in development somebody has said that is one of the 10 major steps in evolution active feeding we have taken it to a different level we cannot control eating but uh, uh, jokes apart you know imagine if you can choose your prey sense it put it in its your mouth then it's a huge step in development yeah. plants can't do that no yeah. they can't move yes sir uh, it was very interesting to know and you know for the first time i read that some organism is immortal like you said potentially immortal, immortal. let's immortal. Uh, let's be uh, more yeah. scientific so yeah, that, yeah. so right and i uh, i was thinking that uh, like can we do research on hydra and make some uh, potions which will make us immortal see uh, basically the kind of molecules that hydra that are used in hydra for pattern formation and that are used in drosophila cynorhabditis humans giraffe monkey or humans are the same the seven basic signaling pathways are same throughout the animal kingdom. but how they are how these genes are expressed and when these genes are expressed is very important and they can certainly give us clues regarding how to expand let's say stem cell populations or um, uh, organ regeneration we do but whether it can be directly applied into an intact organism mm. of a more complex nature is an issue that uh, remains to be seen because we cannot say that it cannot be done because you know science is progressing so fast so nothing seems to be impossible right now yes yeah so uh, that's all question i have sir okay. thank you very much for your time right